and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist and we're going to talk about sleep apnea especially in surgery like in an operating room like you see here this is a real operating room real operating room table real ventilator even real anesthesia medications what happens when you have sleep apnea under anesthesia and how can anesthesia actually trigger a cure to sleep apnea in ways that you've probably never heard of before. We're going to talk about that today because so many of you have asked about is surgery safe when you have sleep apnea? The answer is it depends. We often make it safe, but when you know more about the sleep apnea, the more safe you can make your surgery and actually catalyze a lifelong change, hopefully a cure. I see Heidi here, Beth, Sailboat, good to see you all. We're going to jump right in about what is sleep apnea, first of all. Well, there's obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea. We're going to focus on the far, far more common one, which is obstructive sleep apnea. That's different than when people stop breathing because their brain is not giving the rest of their body the breathing signal, but rather the brain is trying to tell the body to breathe, but the body's soft tissues are often getting in the way and causing what sounds like really, really intense snoring. Uh, Robin, good to see you and life with Princess Mano, good to see you as well. So is sleep apnea a silent killer, first of all? Usually no, because usually you have intense snoring around the time of the apneic event. However, if you don't hear anything at all, it means that your body, and this is lethal by the way, especially after surgery, if you don't hear any snores at all, it might be because all of the tissues have collapsed around your mouth above your larynx so that you're trying to breathe in. It's like breathing through a straw and somebody just clamped the straw shut. And that clamping shut can cause incredibly large pressures in your chest that will suck fluid in. When that fluid gets sucked into your lungs, it can cause you to drown. Uh, it can, we call it pulmonary edema, and it's called an obstructive pulmonary edema if it happens after surgery because the anesthesia medications, in particular opioids like fentanyl or Dilaudid, have made you so sleepy that you're sleeping like this and you're suddenly having laxity of all the soft tissue around your neck and your mouth, and then suddenly it all collapses above your windpipe so you try to breathe from your chest, cause negative pressure in here, you suck because it's negative pressure. You can't get air in with a negative pressure. Instead, it sucks water in. Negative pressure pulmonary edema. Now that's realistically quite rare because we have all sorts of tools in surgery to help minimize that. The most common being this guy here called an oral airway. This literally goes in your mouth to keep everything stented open so that if you have a big tongue or lots of other tissues around your mouth, it'll pop them all open to allow the negative pressure in your chest to bring air in from the outside, oxygen, air, etc., and help you breathe out carbon dioxide. So that's the first tool here. It's called an oral airway. Yes, life with Princess Mano. Sleep apnea is very dangerous, not only in surgery, but what happens outside of surgery? If you're having sleep apnea, like you're having low oxygen saturations for extensive periods overnight, let's say hours, you're at increased risk of cardiovascular disease, heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, uh, strokes. Uh, also, ADHD is often a result of poor sleep the night before because you were snoring and kept waking, sleeping, waking, sleeping. You may not remember all of the wake-ups, but because your brain is constantly on high alert. You're not getting restorative sleep, so you might be distractible the next day. So ADHD-like symptoms. Ex increased risk of getting into car accidents because if you're drowsy while driving, because you weren't sleeping well the night before, boom, one of the, number, one of the uh, top killers, especially in young adults, motor vehicle accidents. Um, also non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome are all possible when you have disrupted sleep from that sleep apnea or it might be associated with obesity from the sleep apnea. Uh, all right, Robin has a CPAP machine every night. Excellent. Thank you for, um, for using that and sharing that. Michelle, very good to see you. I hope your child science fair goes well or your child's science fair goes well. 
Life with Princess Mono asks, what if we have a loss of breath while sleeping? Does it mean that sleep apnea can cause death? It's often very rare. Hey, Melissa, hi back to you. It's rare to die because eventually your body wakes up and when you're awake, you're not gonna have sleep apnea because you're not asleep. Sleep apnea has sleep in the name of it, right? So your brain forces your body to wake up and then you start to breathe again, but that's what disrupts the sleep. Now, other things can look like sleep apnea. Other things can mimic daytime sleepiness for sure. Uh, and by the way, I have way more tools about what we do in the operating room that I'm gonna show you in a minute for how we overcome sleep apnea. Uh, Melissa, you're definitely not alone having sleep apnea. I see Beth also has a CPAP. Um, Chris, good to see you, and Pam Roberts, good to see you. We'll get to your questions in just a second. Um, always remember that not all daytime drowsiness is from sleep apnea. It can be from restless leg syndrome, from sedatives that you're using, benzodiazepines like Xanax for anxiety, um, narcolepsy, bad acid reflux, or esophageal disorders might cause you to wake up in the middle of the night because you're maybe actively vomiting stuff. And of course, nighttime panic attacks are bad nightmares that are causing patients to wake up, constantly waking up, not getting restful sleep. Uh, the causes of sleep apnea. First and foremost, for obstructive sleep apnea, likely obesity related. Smoking can play a role. Um, nasal congestion can make it harder to breathe through your nose, right? Um, and then alcohol, weed, what do these do? They typically, they help you fall asleep, but they all disrupt REM sleep. They absolutely mess with your sleep cycles. And many patients will say, oh, my glass of wine helps me fall asleep. My joint helps me fall asleep, but I wake up at one in the morning and I can't fall back asleep again. Whether this is related to sleep apnea, you know, there's one study that says that yes, cannabis increases the airway, uh, muscle, muscles in your airway, increases their tone to keep them open. It's only one study and it's not very reproducible. So I do not recommend weed or alcohol in patients that have sleep apnea as a way to fix their sleep apnea. Absolutely not. But what does anesthesia have to do with possibly curing anesthesia? We'll get to that in a second. I got to answer so many great questions that came in. Uh, first, Nor1S. I never felt good after sleeping. And my wife noticed I would uh, gasp or stop breathing for a bit. So I got a CPAP and it was a life changer. Exactly, Nor. <laughs> you got it dead on. When you have something in your mouth, either putting pressure in there, kind of like what the ventilator behind me does, when you're having surgery, or you have an appliance like an oral airway, or the other breathing tubes, I'll show you in a minute, you can help absolutely improve your sleep and uh, reduce a lot of the daytime symptoms. Chris says, I have a question about your clinic. How close do you interact with the patient, patient's other providers? Oh, we're talking about ketamine now. Chris will make a quick diversion because this is so important. Uh, it's actually relevant. It's, what we're going right now with the sleep apnea. So Chris, I'll answer your question and talk about sleep apnea cures under anesthesia because this is so powerful. We know that likely the greatest contributor to sleep apnea is gonna be obesity, smoking, alcohol, etc. Alcohol from its excess calories. When someone is having a psychedelic medicine experience, whether it's under anesthesia or like in my ketamine infusion clinic, patients can wake up from that experience or um, integrate that experience in a way that helps change their relationship with the contributors to their sleep apnea in the first place. Great evidence comes from perioperative smoking cessation. So patients come into an operating room like this one here, and they come in having smoked their whole life. But we know that smoking has huge risks under anesthesia and after anesthesia, and makes wound healing after anesthesia not as optimal as it could be. We're talking worse scars, longer healing times, it means more pain. Risk of certain surgeries not being successful, especially if it's like a skin graft that's dependent on good perfusion. We know that nicotine and all the sympathomimetic components in cigarette smoke make those blood vessels get cr uh, clamped down. My point here is that as patients recognize that, wow, this smoking and it's gonna change all my surgery outcome here. They realize that, they have a psychedelic experience, potentially, if they're especially guided by their anesthesiologist, they may wake up quitting smoking cold turkey. What else could you do for your health that is more impactful and empowering than quitting smoking? It doesn't end with smoking. How about sugar, processed foods, 
all of the obesity that patients struggle with that might be leading to their sleep apnea, alcohol addiction that can contribute to sleep apnea, not only from the calories, but also from what alcohol does to REM sleep disruption. Guys, this is the beauty of what we, when we can tap into our inner healing potential through a guided experience, which Chris, what I do in my clinic is I absolutely get in touch with the patient psychiatrist, their therapist, and we coordinate everything so that as they get they go through that healing journey with ketamine if it's before surgery i call them the night before and i try to make that anesthesia experience as healing as possible so that they can be comfortable know that they're loved and guided when someone's trusting their life with me to manage their sleep apnea or their depression or their anxiety or their chronic pain they deserve that same level of trust and respect and passion or compassion back to them it's not that big of an ask for patients that are trusting me with so much responsibility for them. And I'm happy to give it. But Chris, it has to be the whole picture, not just the ketamine. Great question. Um, lingual tonsil hypertrophy. Um, I don't need surgery. Well, Melissa, I'm so happy to hear that you were able to avoid surgery. And I certainly hope that, um, that you won't need it again in the future. It won't come up again. The laryngospasm. Um, we've talked about before, it can happen with endoscopies, but you now know more about that. And that knowledge, as you know, is key to better understanding and hopefully reducing your anxiety, reducing the need for anxiety medications that might just increase that risk in that endoscopy. So um, I was saying under anesthesia, <sighs> under anesthesia, I got to show you a little bit more about, because we're going to wrap up here. When you're under anesthesia with sleep apnea, of course I'd like you to wake up, not wanting to have those sugary drinks again, not wanting to do those behaviors that may have caused the weight gain in the first place, but we have to manage you on this table first. Anesthesia can cause serious complications if you don't have a breathing tube in place, like this one here. This is the LMA. This goes in the back of your mouth to force the airway open. So even if you have sleep apnea, we're ventilating you are pushing air with this ventilator here past the floppy tissues or it might be with a breathing tube like this one here where it goes past everything that would flop shut to push air in and out that's not dangerous what is dangerous though is if you don't have general anesthesia if you don't have the breathing tube in place and hey after every surgery we have to take the breathing tube out that is the danger it's not the breathing tube being in there, it's what happens if it's under sedation without a breathing tube or when you wake up. When you wake up, you still have a little bit of anesthesia on board. That relaxes all of the tissues in your mouth, causes them to flop. So I can't give that much more pain medication because the patient might get apneic. Patients can go home after surgeries and die in their sleep. It's not very common, but we always have to be extra, extra careful prescribing opioids to patients after surgery if they have sleep apnea, because you already have a tenuous situation where they might stop breathing in their sleep, you put some opioids on there, oxycodones, whatever, and you've just taken away even more of their drive to breathe, pair that with sleep, especially if they're drinking alcohol, which you should never do in these scenarios, taking Xanax, which you should never do in this scenario, that is a setup for disaster. And that risk continues for up to 72 hours after surgery because anesthesia also disrupts your normal sleep cycles, which we believe contributes to increased risk of apnea when you're asleep. Once again, throw some opioids in there and you're in trouble because you don't have an anesthesiologist with a ventilator like the one behind me to monitor you as you're sleeping at night. The CPAP is critical for that. You should always use your CPAP because it helps minimize all the other risks we're talking about at the beginning, but especially the risk of death after surgery. Now, the other thing, Oh, Darian's birthday is tomorrow. You'll be 33. Darian, I'm wishing you an early happy birthday. Um, hey, Blue, thank you so much for the kind comments. Uh, okay, okay. With so many great, so many great comments here. Um, but I got to finish the sleep apnea. Then we'll answer a couple more of your questions. Now, if you're having sedation, this is key because many surgeries are done with sedation, with a nerve block and sedation not general anesthesia. And that's often preferable because, hey, if you don't need this breathing tube going down your mouth, past your vocal cords, you minimize a lot of the risks. Like you probably you won't have a risk of uh, vocal cord damage. You know, um, 
lower chance of waking up delirious, waking up nauseous, waking up emotional, because you're not under general anesthesia, you're under sedation. But if you have sleep apnea and you don't have the breathing tube to bypass all of those floppy airways, well now you're in trouble because what's going to keep you from closing your airways and generating that negative pressure in your chest leading to negative pulmonary, sorry, negative pressure pulmonary edema. Well, sometimes I put one of these in a the patient. Even though they're kind of awake, it's kind of uncomfortable. And guys, guys they go, you, the way you put it in is you flip it upside down like that. You put it up above your tongue and you flip it in their mouth and you put it down here. So that can save a life. But unfortunately, sometimes if someone is obese and they have sleep apnea, we can't do sedation for their anesthesia. They'll have to go under general anesthesia. That's usually not preferable because now they have more risks, more side effects when it could have just been done under sedation. Sleep apnea makes it difficult to do cases under sedation. Sleep apnea also makes it difficult to do surgeries in surgery centers, and you often have to go to a hospital because, like I said, you can die in the operating room or in the recovery period when you're still not fully awake. You need much longer monitoring times when you have sleep apnea. We can't do those in a surgery center where people come in and leave a couple hours later. Some of these sleep apnea patients need to be monitored for hours and hours after surgery because these medications, like Dilaudid, can last a long time. Anesthesia gas can stick in the body for a long time. Anesthesia gas, propofol, all these things are fat soluble because they got to go into the brain, right? Brain's made of fat. Well, when you have obesity, there's a lot of fat stores in the body and the anesthesia does build up in there, just like a weed and THC build up in fatty body deposits throughout uh, your whole body and leads to having a positive urine test for up to a month after. So let's just review at the end and say that when patients have that experience and feel motivated by a loving, caring doctor, medical team, etc., they can often wake up with a different perspective on food addictions that may have contributed to obesity in the first place. Different connection with alcohol to hopefully not be an excess alcohol user that may have contributed to sleep apnea in the first place. Getting off of benzodiazepines and other sleep aids like Ambien, Seroquel, etc., Trazodone can also help reduce the risks associated with sleep apnea, especially if they're tipping someone over the edge to having more hypoxic events overnight or having excess daytime sleepiness because none of those really help natural sleep in the first place anyways. And Lastly, we said that medical cannabis uh, probably not going to help sleep apnea at all. If anything, might even cause risk if it makes them too sleepy or contributes to worse REM sleep disruption. So I hope that answers so much of your questions about the dangers of sleep apnea inside and outside the operating room. If you learned something, do please hit that like button so I can do more of these lives for you and answer more of your questions. Your support helps me do this more often and your questions are so fantastic. I will end saying, is it dangerous to have an LMA placed without any anesthesia? The answer is yes, because it might cause gagging or my finger to be cut off, uh, bit off by the patient. Blue Omega, uh, Lone Star, Robin, Melissa, Heidi, everyone, Darian, happy early birthday. I look forward to seeing you all soon. Until next time.